Did you know that the PS5 has its own hidden voice assistant that once enabled, you wake by saying, hey, PlayStation, and can use it to control basically the entire console. We've come a long way since the PS1. Even that had its strange features. Like, did you know that one of the most common errors on PS1 was a disc read error that was solved by, I kid you not, turning the console upside down? <laughs> or that certain games on the original PlayStation will actually keep playing even if you remove the disc that they're playing from. And the craziest part of this is that you can then replace that disc with a music CD that will then change the background music within the game. This is what you didn't know about PlayStation. From the revenge story that started the company, to the failed projects they tried to hide, to the honestly shocking easter eggs that were staring at us in the face the entire time. Like for instance, you know how the cross button is almost universally used in games to either confirm or proceed? And how circle is always used to go back? Well, it's designed that way because here in the west we associate the cross with X marks the spot, something that you would head towards if you were on a map. And the red circle is a stop sign that you would want to back away from. And it does not stop there. The designer of the original PlayStation controller, Teiyu Goto, he chose all four of these button shapes very deliberately, with triangle apparently representing a view point, and square representing a piece of paper, which is why it's so often used to access menus. And even beyond the clever meanings behind them, the simple choice to use shapes instead of the letters that every other company like Nintendo and Sega were using was also significant. Because not only did Sony want to stand out from the crowd in the market, they also literally had to differentiate the PS1 from Nintendo's SNES system. Because the original PlayStation actually came from a collaboration between these two companies. Sony was actually working with Nintendo to develop a CD-based add-on console for the SNES, until Nintendo decided to switch supplier and ditch Sony without even telling them. To which Sony basically said, screw you Nintendo. They used what they built and what they'd learned to create their own console. And that was the first PlayStation. I'm so glad I caught that. And once they decided that they were making a console, things changed very quickly. The PS1 was originally gonna have a flat gamepad controller inspired by Nintendo, like basically every other popular controller at the time. But Sony's president, Norio Oga, who was a big fan of aircraft, he hated it, and he asked for something more similar to an airplane control yoke, which is where we got this whole dual hand grip design that's now become the world standard. Now, if you've seen my video where I unboxed every single PlayStation console brand new, then you might remember when the PS1 launched, the company they ended up killing on their quest for Nintendo's head was Sega. And they did it with just three numbers. Sega's fully 3D console, the Saturn, released a whole month before the PS1, which should have been a disaster for Sony, but Sony had one massive advantage. They'd managed to make their PlayStation a whole hundred dollars cheaper than the 399 Sega Saturn, leading to maybe the biggest mic drop moment in games presentation history where they announced the price. 299. And once Sony had dethroned Sega, they went on what I can only describe as the biggest offensive I've ever seen from a company against their original rival, Nintendo. Creating this radical, edgy mascot whose sole purpose was just to be the Super Mario killer in the form of Crash Bandicoot. And they went hard. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. I mean, this super aggressive marketing was really successful in the West, but it's kind of funny because it did not land as well in Japan, which led Sony to basically create two different versions of him, completely overhauling Crash's entire design and sanding down his rougher edges and personality to give him a more cutesy look that appealed more to the culture there. But even then, unlike Sonic for Sega, Mario for Nintendo, or I guess Master Chief for Xbox, Crash did not really stick around for Sony. The company's been trying tirelessly over the last two decades to find a mascot that fits as well. Because, you know, it's great for sales, it's great for merchandise, but it begs the obvious question. Have they succeeded? Does PlayStation finally have an official mascot? Well, do you remember Knack? That PS4 launch game where you play as a guy made of basically living particle effects designed to show off the system's capabilities. If you don't, I mean, that's probably why he's not the answer. A lot of people have called Knack uh, a failed mascot because the game was basically trying to be the PS4's reinvention of a Crash Bandicoot game. But the gameplay wasn't the best. And I mean, look at it. If you want people to actually remember your mascot, they should at least be able to draw him. Sony have plenty of recognizable characters. You've got Kratos from God of War, you've got Ratchet from Ratchet and Clank, but the problem Sony runs into is that these characters are often used to market their own specific games. So really, there's only three contenders for the one character that represents PlayStation as a brand. There's Toro, who's specifically the mascot for the PlayStation Network, but has just become a big name in general in Japan, appearing in tons of games as an Easter egg, and even being a playable character in Sony's PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale fighting game, where you can, funnily enough, fight against the second top contender. 
Polygon Man. This guy, believe it or not, was the originally planned PlayStation mascot, even appearing in print adverts before the PS1 even came out. But the creator of the PlayStation, Ken Kutaragi, thankfully saw this for what it was, decided it was a little bit creepy and had him scrapped before launch. Until he returned as literally the final boss of PlayStation All-Stars, which is one of the most coincidentally full circle real life plot lines. He was abandoned at launch, he became evil, and now he's the main villain to fight using the PlayStation characters that actually did make the cut. Then who I think is the closest thing to Sony's new mascot, and who it looks like we're going to be seeing a lot more of going forward, is Astrobot. This little guy completely fits the PlayStation aesthetic. He's well animated, he's really expressive, and Sony's already basically made it his job to show you what the PS5 can do in the free launch game Astro's Playroom, where the levels are literally different parts inside the PS5. Which, side note, is actually surprisingly great for a tech demo. This game is jam-packed full of obscure references and easter eggs from all of PlayStation history. Speaking of which, Sony love their easter eggs. Especially across games developed by PlayStation's own studios. Like in Ghost of Tsushima, you can visit different shrines themed after other games like God of War and Bloodborne and actually get different armor sets based on those games. There's even bits of origami on a random table based on other famous PlayStation titles like Ratchet and Clank, The Last of Us and Shadow of the Colossus. In Death Stranding, you can find a hologram of Aloy, the main character from the Horizon games, and you can even get a quest from someone who's actually the real-life head of Sony Interactive Entertainment Studios worldwide, Herman Holst. This company even hid secrets in games as grim and serious as The Last of Us Part 2. My favourite being that if you try and shoot this long-abandoned PS3, your gun just won't fire. The only other items in the game that you can't shoot at are literally sacred, like an actual synagogue. I see what you're doing there, Sony. And if you're enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be so neat. See what I did there, Sony. But these Easter eggs even extend to the consoles themselves. If you've ever been to a Disney park, you might have noticed that they love to hide these hidden Mickeys everywhere, basically just playing a game with themselves of how many Mickey Mouse symbols they can hide in plain sight as possible. Well, Sony have been doing basically the exact same thing, but just with the PlayStation shapes. It's very fun. Like for example, if you look at the back of the PS4 Pro or the PS4 Slim models, these feet at the bottom are those shapes, but it even extends to the insides. Like if I take off this top panel on the PS4, they're also on the screws holding the hard drive in place. I've actually got one more of these console Easter eggs show you, but it's so incredibly cool that it's actually going to be number one in this video. But the point is, Sony throws in tons of hidden features. Like, you know the iconic PlayStation 2 boot-up screen? Have you ever noticed that those weird spooky pillars aren't always the same height? You might have even noticed more or less of them at different times. Well, that's because they actually represent your save files. There's one tower for each, and they get taller the more data you save in each game. And so because this console has no memory card in it right now, there are no save files and therefore no pillars. I've known about this boot screen for 20 years of my life, and I've only this week realized that fact. And speaking of the PS2, when do you think the last game was released for it? For context, the PS3 launched in 2006, so you'd think like 2007, maybe 2008 the PS2 would be finished, right? Well, the game was actually FIFA 2014. The PS2 was so incredibly successful that it was only discontinued the same year that the PS4 came out. The thing even got Netflix support, which is not what it looks like today. There were no apps on PS2. You had to order a specific disc from Netflix just to access it. And I mean, at that point, screw it. Why not just turn your PS2 into a full-on computer with the PS2 Linux operating system disc? It even came with a keyboard, mouse, network adapter, and a 40 gigabyte hard drive. But what about the actual games? Lightning round time. These are the best-selling games on each PlayStation console. Starting with Gran Turismo on PS1 at 10.85 million total units. Then on PS2, it's GTA San Andreas, which was multi-platform but sold 17.3 million copies on PlayStation alone. So you won't be surprised to hear that the PS3's was GTA 5 with 20 million units. For a console that sold just over 80 million, that's an insane ratio. In fact, GTA 5 was such a powerhouse that the exact same game also nearly made the number one spot on PS4 too, but was just edged out by Spider-Man, which has managed to hit closer to 25. But then it gets complicated for the PS5. Sony hasn't released proper global sales data, but we can get an idea of the winners from the top games on the PSN store. Like in 2020, PS5's first year, the most downloaded game in most regions was Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. And since then, it's largely been a rotating combination of NBA, FIFA, and Call of Duty. Not the most exciting list, but it makes sense. I mean, football's pretty hard to compete against, especially here in the UK. Right. And other now, let's talk about what you didn't know about the Enigma 
that was the PlayStation original. Like on the home menu, for instance, did you ever notice that if you move the PS3 six-axis gyro controller, the particles in the background move with that gyro sensor? Which was actually kind of controversial at the time of the console's launch, because when people got their hands on this controller for the very first time, it's only then that they realized something was missing it didn't have rumble. Naturally, people were asking why, and Sony said that they dropped it because it would interfere with the new motion sensors, which, if you picked up a controller in the last decade, might sound a bit sus. And that's because it was almost certainly a straight up lie. It's widely believed that Sony actually axed the rumble feature, in fact, because they were being sued by a company called Immersion for copying their tech. And since Sony then released the motion and rumble capable DualShock 3 controller right after settling in court with Immersion, I'm inclined to believe the story. But Motion is not the only gimmick Sony experimented with on the PS3. In what was maybe the company's most obscure demo ever, they managed to use a PSP as a rear view mirror in a PS3 racing game. You can see why it didn't come to market, but this is such an interesting way to integrate two of their key products. On the subject of scrapped features though, it's time to talk about PlayStation's failed products, like PlayStation View, which was actually one of the very first online video streaming services ever. It gave people a collection of both live and on-demand content, but failed, I think, in large part just because of the name. You could get PlayStation View on other platforms, like on your Amazon Fire TV box, but the name made it seem like something that required a PlayStation to use, which actually ruled out most of the people that could have benefited from it. Then there's PlayStation's official 3D display. And I mean, if you've ever had the privilege of using a 3D display, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise why they discontinued it. But it did have one unique feature that I still think could be huge today. It could use its 3D ability, which involves generating one image for each one of your eyes, to instead play in 2D, but send two separate full screen images to two couch multiplayer players, instead of them having to split screen. Oh, and remember this quite unpopular controller that the PS3 launched with? Well, it is not nearly as cursed as what they almost went with. At E3 2005, Sony showcased to the entire world the PlayStation 3, and alongside it, the boomerang controller. Except the backlash after seeing this futuristic banana was so vocal that Sony realized they had to do a complete 180 before the console even came to market. But a failed project that fans actually did like was PlayStation Home on the PS3. It was basically a virtual social hub, very similar to something like Second Life or Meta's Horizon Worlds, where you could make an avatar, decorate your own home, hang out and play games with other players. It had a really loving fan base, but unfortunately, Home was basically doomed when Phil Harrison, then head of Sony's Worldwide Studios, who'd been championing the entire project, left the company in 2008. The higher ups didn't really care that much about it, and without him to argue for it, let it slowly drift into irrelevance until it was eventually shut down in 2015. And then, of course, I was gonna say Sony's most tragic blunder. That was nearly ours. <laughs> the PS Vita. Ask basically anyone who had one of these bad boys, and they will likely start a spiel about how, despite being abandoned by Sony, the Vita is still one of the greatest handhelds of all time. I know because I'm one of those people. I basically founded this channel covering it. And you would think any successor to the PSP, given how well that thing did, should have been a mammoth success. But unfortunately, it wasn't just Nintendo's 3DS that they had to compete against, it was also mobile gaming. And whereas Nintendo changed their tactics and relentlessly supported the 3DS with big games so it could keep up the fight, Sony basically cut their losses early, leaving the PS Vita with little support and very few major releases until it was discontinued, most likely being the nail in the coffin for Sony's handheld efforts. And along with the Vita was its weird cousin, the PlayStation TV, which was basically Sony's way of saying, okay, this Vita situation is pretty bad, how do we make the most of it? So they equipped the PlayStation TV with the exact same internals of the PlayStation Vita, but just without the screen and the controls, which did effectively just make it an incredibly cheap TV box, but one that also had access to an existing library of games that you could play with a PS3 or PS4 controller you just had lying around. It sounds like a great idea. By swapping game and memory cards back and forth between your Vita and your PS TV, you could basically have a slightly jankier version of the Nintendo Switch, which is really cool. But the problem was that most of the people it appealed to already had PS3s or PS4s that just did the same thing better. What would you say was Sony's first handheld though? It wasn't the PlayStation Vita, surely the PSP, right? Nope. It was the Pocket Station, which is genuinely the strangest combination of two tech products I've ever heard of. Sony called it a combination between a PS1 memory card and a personal digital assistant. It had a tiny little LCD display, even tinier buttons, allowing you to play extra content from specific games. And since it was Japan only, we never saw any of it. 
But there is an even more in your face secret that you still probably have not seen. You know how we talked about how Sony is constantly trying to hide these PlayStation shapes within their designs? Well, if you have a PS5 and you've ever noticed the grip texture on the back of your DualSense controller, zoom in and you will see 40,000 shapes in total, each literally only a few microns high. And they're actually not just on the controller, they're on the media control remote, the wireless headset, even on the inside of the side plates of the console itself. That's attention to detail. To see me unbox every single PlayStation console brand new, that video is here. I'll see you there.